Hello, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nick Anderson, and I'm the project director for American Roundtable, and welcome to today's event. You were just listening to the soundscape to Rumfords by media artists Steve Norton and N.B. Aldrich. This soundscape is included in the report, Maine's River Valley, Labor, Landscapes, and Legacies, which was conceived by editors Aaron Kayer and Carrie Arsenault, and which is, of course, the topic of today's program. Carrie and Aaron thought two Rumfords might be the perfect way to introduce the River Valley and the ways in which nature and industry parallel one another in this community. Today's program is the fourth in a series of conversations that complement the nine reports commissioned by the Architectural League's American Roundtable. For those of you new to this initiative, a few words of background about the project. American Roundtable seeks to bring together on the ground perspectives on the condition of American small to mid-sized communities and what they need to thrive going forward. The proposition at the heart of this initiative is that too often our understanding of rural areas and small cities is reduced to caricature and oversimplification. So our hope is to highlight in all their complexity and nuance, communities often overlooked and to provide platforms for individuals and organizations to share their stories and work imagining, understanding and improving their local built environments. The nine reports of American Roundtable each look at a different community or region in the United States. The first five reports on West Virginia, the lower Rio Grande region of New Mexico, Maine's River Valley, South Beach, Washington, and along the Lumbee River, North Carolina have been digitally published. And the others are forthcoming later this winter and spring. I don't wanna to take too much time away from today's presentation and discussion. So I encourage you to visit archley.org to learn more about the entire initiative and to explore the reports. I will shortly turn the screen over to Aaron and Carrie who will introduce and share thoughts on their report. I'll then be joined by the league's executive director, Rosalie Ginevro, and we will all discuss the report in more detail. We do hope to take some questions from the audience at that time. So please add questions to the Zoom chat feature. Additionally, um, three of the report's contributors, um, Steve Norton and B. Aldrich, whose soundscape you just heard, and Tom Latham, who um, provided a number of really beautiful watercolors on the River Valley's industrial landscapes. Um, and many River Valley residents are in the audience today. And we do hope to hear everyone's thoughts and questions. Aaron Kerr is an architectural historian and assistant professor of architecture history at the University of New Mexico. He was raised and educated in the town of Rumford before leaving the River Valley for college. Kayer studied architecture at Norwich University in Vermont, where he earned undergraduate and graduate degrees, as well as at UCLA, where he received his PhD in architecture. Carrie Arsenault also grew up in the River Valley, and she is now a book critic, the book review editor for Orion Magazine, contributing editor at the Literary Hub, and author of Milltown, Reckoning with What Remains. And here's a copy of that. Um, I highly recommend it. It's um, another look at the River Valley and um, is a really wonderful sort of complement to the report. She received her MFA from the New School and studied in the Graduate Program in Communication for Development at Sweden's Malmo University. Her work has appeared in the Boston Globe, the Washington Post, Airmail, Freeman's, the Paris Review Daily, and the New York Review of Books. And with that, I will turn things over to Aaron and Carrie. Hi, Aaron. Thank you, Nick. Thank you so much. And and, and everybody at the Architectural League. Um, and thank you so much for the River Valley residents for showing up and on mass. <laughs> Great to see you. Thank you I, uh, yeah. again also to Nick and, and, and Rosalie and everyone for joining. Um, and I realize that today we'll talk about some, some uh, histories that will be familiar to many of you, um, but perhaps not so familiar to others. So, so forgive the kind of, um, the, the kind of breadth uh, that, we'll, that we'll discuss today, and hopefully we'll have an interesting discussion after. Um, so we thought we would begin by just describing this, this place, right? Um, <clears throat> Maine's rural, rural kind of paper mill community known as the River Valley, which is uh, my and Carrie's hometown, as Nick mentioned. Um, and it includes a cluster of uh, nine working class uh, towns in the foothills of Maine, um, through which this kind of meandering Androscoggin River runs. Um, and 
at first glance, the River Valley's natural resources render it quite idyllic, um, I think, among American landscapes. So there are mountain springs that flow in tune with the moon. Uh, the river has a waterfall that has been described as, as having the largest vertical drop in the east, really rivaled only by uh, Niagara Falls. And the list kind of goes on and on. Um, and so, however, since the turn of the 19th century, though, the valley has um, de been defined really by the paper mill, um, the sounds of it, the smells of it, um, the money of it, um, which once was a, 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 a local family owned um, mill um, and, and business that is now owned by the Chinese company Nine Dragons. And so in a series of contributions um, in our report, which we'll, we'll talk about today, we consider and thought about the ways in which the politics and conundrums of industrial working class communities um, in the face of our, our current kind of post-industrial age, what that means, um, the, the kinds of processes and powers of resource extraction um, of water and trees, um, and we try to center the story of the worker. Um, uh, so how do mill workers and community members fight against these kinds of powers historically as well as, as contemporaneously? And how does the community kind of come together um, in, and in that togetherness define itself? Yeah, um, I'll just jump in for a brief second just to add a little bit to what Aaron said. And, you know, part of it is, is, is fighting against this the problems that the resource extraction have brought. But the other part of that is it's really a conundrum too for the people that work there um, um, because they're, people are making the very thing that could be killing them, which is paper, which um, is a, a very um, a toxic byproduct um, from bleaching paper um, has permeated the land, the air and the people. So that part of that conundrum too is, is also a conundrum for uh, Aaron and I, because we're here we are reporting on a place that we're from. And it's something I did too in the past 10 years in my book. Um, in fact, the entire plot of the book is me um, leaving and returning home to figure out many issues, the same kind of issues that the Architectural League asked us to report on. Um, but what I found is, you know, this, rather than finding an answer, I found instead a dialogue I was having uh, with home and place and identity, which informs this report, which informed my book. And I think informed, same with Aaron, um, with each, because with each departure and return, which was over a series of 10 years, again, I sort of interrogate the question, what questions, what does it mean to be from a place that doesn't always love you back? Or what does it mean to be from the working class when you're not living in the working class anymore? And what does it mean to stay or leave a place that has defined you? And this movement between proximity and distance, me leaving and coming and going, recursive movement, sort of underlined that distance between being, underlying the idea that I was an insider and an outsider to this town. And I was also a witness and a participant in this town for 10 years and a critic and an advocate to the River Valley. And all this dialogue was sort of part of the larger conversation that hadn't been had or had been distorted over the years about the working class, about Acadians, which is um, my heritage, the American dream, the disenfranchised people, um, who, who have been disenfranchised by resource extraction or exploitation, and also the larger conversation about Maine's nickname, Vacation Land. Absolutely. And so this, these kind of questions and frameworks really um, uh, thread together all of, all of the contributions and all of the report. Um, and so we'll start just today by, by kind of walking through the pieces of the report. So in the, the, the report about work, um, we focused um, uh, on the mill in particular. And in my section on uh, the work that I contributed about the work, um, <clears throat> the work on the work um, has to do with the meaning uh, and the kind of making of the mill itself. Um, and so the Oxford Paper Company um, opened its doors in, in 1901 um, and was established by uh, Canadian, Canadian industrialist Hugh Chisholm, um, as, as many in the, in the room know. Um, and it was founded there because of the river um, and the waterfall that was used for the power. Um, and my, my report considers the mill as um, historian David Nye has described paper mills, which is part of this kind of uh, American technological sublime. And he uses this term to suggest that 
modern uh, industrial technologies such as paper mills elicit the same kind of reactions of wonder and awe and terror that are prompted by nature or that are found in nature. And so these, these kind of qualities are characterized by kind of abstract depictions of, um, uh, of the area, including by these aerial perspectives. Um, here you see uh, this, this painting that was completed for Chisholm as part of the early planning stages of, of the town and actually hangs now in the Rumford Historical Society. And it shows this kind of all encompassing uh, view that draws us in. And so the mill becomes the kind of disciplining force of the community, like a kind of godlike figure. Um, and, and so it starts to kind of shape everyone's schedule, routine, and life is really organized around it. And so in the report, I try to think through, like, how do we make sense of this grip, um, this power, um, and the material representations of it? Um, and so I became, as an architecture historian, might very interested in the history of the paper mill. And I would say there's, there's so much more that needs to be kind of uncovered about the history of the mill. Um, but what I found was um, a whole history of global practice. And by that, I mean, um, there was an architect who was commissioned for the mill, uh, Ashley Tower, who was a Massachusetts based architect um, and uh, became known for paper mills globally. So there were paper mills that were produced not only in, in Maine by these architects, by, but also in Japan and Brazil. Um, in Brazil, also the paper mill um, produces uh, the money there. Um, so I became fascinated by the uh, number of kind of patents that were also designed as part of an architectural project. Um, and, and you're seeing one of the patents that Tower uh, completed here, which was a machine for grinding pulp. Um, and so essentially what you're seeing is the kind of wood would come through these hoppers, uh, that are the, the kind of radial um, hoppers. Um, and then ground up in the center um, in, into pulp. And, and so this, this kind of terminology in the machine, this idea of the grind um, has, has come to represent the kind of mechanisms um, uh, that, that kind of embody the sense of work um, in the mill itself that are, that are then translated. Um, interestingly enough, um, the, the architect was also at the same time as designing paper mills was also designing prisons. Um, so, which I think is interesting when you think about um, the ways in which the machines quite literally uh, become mechanisms and dis disciplines of a of, uh, sense of order. Um, so fascinating kind of architectural histories there um, in, in the, the architectural history. Um, and then in the second part of the, the kind of work piece, I, I look to the history of the mill itself um, what it produces, but also of the supply. So thinking about of the wood uh, as well as the local labor. And, and at one point, um, the mill was the largest book uh, paper producer in the United States. And it became known for its, um, and still known for its uh, high gloss paper um, that also helps us to lure us in in some level um, for magazines like National Geographic, soup labels, magazines like O Magazine. Um, and it's been described as the, the quote, Tiffany of uh, the paper industry. So I became interested in the ways in which there have been a number of best selling uh, novels um, about the town. Now we can add carries to this. Um, and, and published on some of the same uh, paper that produced by the mill, not carries. Um, so it was interesting to me to think about um, the ways in which this kind of new post-industrial output of the mill. Um, so thinking about like what is actually sold by the mill is not just the paper, um, but actually the stories of the workers um, and the community. So stories of struggle, of loss, of defeat that, that resonates with other working class uh, people across the US and, and really globally. Um, and as many know, um, by the early 1990s, the river, the river Valley became known as the quote, Cancer Valley, um, as a number of news articles uh, termed it, um, due to the relative high rates of, or the perceived high rates of cancer in uh, the River Valley um, that were uh, thought to be associated with environmental pollution um, caused by the mill. Um, and while it's been increasingly impossible to, to uh, prove a kind of environmental cause and effect, and a number of studies have, have been conducted that have proved really inconclusive, um, <clears throat> many uh, uh, community members have been concerned um, uh, and, and recently dismissed. Um, but as you can see, the, uh, the, this kind of glossing over the narrative um, 
uh, pertains also to, to, to demographics and, and health statistics. But you can see um, here the Maine's um, uh, cancer rates are consistently higher though. Um, uh, so Maine is the blue line here, higher than um, the US average. Um, so in our report, we start thinking about like, how do we disrupt um, industrial, this kind of sense and the power of the industrial sublime, right? The, that, that the mill really represents. Um, and so one of these strategies that, that um, uh, arch architect and artist Tom Latham uh, has con contributed for our report is to think about humanizing it really. And um, so in his watercolor series, um, uh, Vermont based uh, architect and watercolorist Tom Latham, who is also with us today and hopefully we can think about and, and um, have a discussion more about kind of creative practice in this. Um, was thinking about the often forgotten historical ruins of industrial communities like the River Valley. Um, and so was focusing on different ruins um, and industrial kind of remnants of the River Valley and articulating them um, with ground perspectives. And this is something that, that contradicts and critiques that, that kind of aerial perspective that we were just looking at, right? So thinking about the ground perspective of these kind of abandoned or fragmented places. Um, and he represents the kind of labor that really is embedded in these industrial structures um, through texture, through the play of uh, light um, and through shadow, um, rather than, than kind of focusing on the mass. Um, so thinking about the negative spaces, um, the partial views um, and the detail that help provoke our imagination to thinking about like how they may have historically been occupied um, or continue to be occupied. So here you can see um, just a kind of sample of some of this work, but there's much more to see um, if, you, if you visit our, our online report. Um, as you are listening to um, the, the infrastructure piece, the infrastructure report, um, uh, we started to think about the ways in which modern infrastructure kind of supported the history of the community um, and helped to really render the environment profitable. So the massive dams, the reservoirs, the bridges, the highways, all of this, this the kind of infrastructure that makes life and industry and business possible. And so uh, Mainers uh, and media artists, Steve uh, Norton and, and B. Aldrich, um, who are also here with us today and hopefully can also speak about their, their uh, creative process, um, produced this six minute soundscape that you heard uh, while you entered the, the kind of Zoom land um, today. And what this soundscape does is juxtaposes two distinct, distinct sonic environments in the River Valley. Um, uh, one is, um, one was located at the Natural Springs uh, uh, on the base of uh, Mount Zirkin. Um, and the other was on the bank of the Swift River that um, lies underneath um, the Main Street Bridge that connects Rumford and Mexico, which you can see in these two photographs here. Um, <clears throat> and they recorded, made recordings on the same day. Um, the recordings consist of a single continuous takes of local ambience, um, as well as multiple simultaneous tracks of various sensors, such as hydrophones and contact microphones. This is all, um, more sophisticated than, than, than what I can speak about. Um, but, but the interesting thing in all of this is that what you're hearing is sound at some level that is communicated through the industrial material, right? And so the sounds of, of the environment are being communicated here and then composed in this, this soundscape. So these places really exhibit, as they argue, the distinct kind of conflicting characterizations of the river valley. Um, <clears throat> So the kind of remote and undeveloped areas like the mountains and the lakes and the streams represented by Mount Zirkin, and then the kind of singular industrial presence of the mill that, that still kind of uh, dominates the, 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 the valley um, and the river uh, like under the bridge. Um, so what does this uh, mean? Um, uh, what does the community look like um, without the mill and, and thinking about you know, a possible future or what might come uh, of, of the River Valley in, in years uh, in the future. Um, uh, artist uh, Nita Elder um, contributed a series of uh, incredible uh, 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 art pieces that consider how we represent the environment and thinking about industry um, and its relationship to environment. And so these drawings are based on archival photographs of the River, River Valley's um, early development. Um, and she argues that within historical cycles of construction and extraction um, that have defined the landscape, 
often these kind of legacies of environmentalism are often camouflaged or concealed. And so what she did is stenciled um, and erased the actual industrial development as a way to kind of reflect on the disruptions and the environmental erasures that have happened here. Um, and interestingly, she used industrial pulp mill, uh, pulp mill waste for these drawings, um, which is a, a kind of raw carbon powder that is a byproduct of, of these paper mills. And so many of the mills kind of incinerate their waste and pulverize it into powder, which is the powder that she uses here. And she argues that it's, it's very, very messy. It's incredibly light, and, but it's also meant to kind of be blown um, away very kind of ephemerally. So really interesting. And, and I would also encourage you to, to, to take a look at that full series um, uh, also on our website. So public space, Carrie, take it away. <clears throat> Hi, I'll talk about this and John Freeman can't join us today, but I have um, read this book a thousand times. So I feel like I can talk a little bit about it. Um, we just excerpted a chapter in this book um, called B is for body and you can read it or you can listen to John read it online. Um, but I'll just give a quick summary about what it's about and how it relates to public space. So he writes in the beginning, we all need language to be spe as specific as possible. This is actually, he writes this in the last lines so of his A to Z assessment of the assault on language. It's what this book is. Words are the basic unit of storytelling. And if the possibilities within them are deflated, then the stories we tell are equally as empty. And if our stories are empty, so is our culture. And that's sort of the premise of this book. Um, in 26 short essays on words from agitate to zygote, John invigorates a discussion on the meaning that words carry how we deploy them, how we can reinvigorate them, and the power of language as a tool for resistance. And that's where it enters our, our sort of public sphere um, aspect of this report. He begins with agitate. I, I thought this was lovely too, because it kind of, it, it, it references to what our, our, our artists are doing too in this report. So what he does is he begins with the word agitate and he builds upon each new letter and to incorporate the previous definition. So on B, he would incorporate agitate into the new definition of B so that the last, so that by zygote, the entire alphabet has been incorporated into the book. So it's kind of like that, that sort of layering or how did you say, um, in, in, it's like the opposite of the erasures. It's like, it's ad additive, like he's adding to the language. Anyway, I thought it was interesting how it worked with our art. Um, he writes, bodies tilting away from darkness. This is what hope really is. As citizens, wherever we are, we have a right to the sovereignty of joy in our bodies. So the body, he is saying, can resist the larger bodies um, of government, of oppression, of fear. This cut, and I just want to say a comment on this cover and then I'll be done. But um, the cover reminds me with this big letter A that stories or ones we create or resist against begin with that, just like one letter. Absolutely. And so this really helped us think through public space, especially in a, a, a community that is so driven by sport, right? Um, and, and leisure, but also at the same time work. Um, so, so thinking about um, uh, public spaces and, and the ways in which bodies gather more, more broadly was, was how we thought about public space. Um, so sites of, of resistance, sites of protest, and, and thinking about the, the, the way in which the body is, is used uh, to kind of fight back. And so, um, so we fo or I focused um, on the, the strikes um, in 1980 and 1986 that, um, that, that took place in uh, Rumford in Mexico. Um, and there were a series of kind of anti-union sanctions across the United States um, during the 1980s um, and, and started to kind of question the, the efficacy of organized labor. Um, and Maine's labor strikes, and in, in particular strikes in Jay, Maine, um, as well as those in the River Valley, have actually been quite widely studied um, as pivotal uh, moments in US labor history. And, and so I find these kind of broader connections to be really interesting to think about, you know, like what is being gleaned or learned from the, the kind of history and the politics of these towns. Um, and so there are, many, there are many strikes um, over the course of the 1900s um, at the paper mill. And for the most part, 
there was enough, there were enough workers to, to on strike that the mill would essentially shut down. They would negotiate um, and then they would reopen. But um, in, in 1986, this started to change. So the mill hired replacement workers um, to keep the mill open. Many workers actually lost their jobs um, and, and some returned to work with, a, with um, just accepting the kind of uh, terms. And the town became incredibly divided, incredibly violent. Um, but as many scholars have argued, there, there was a kind of forced microorganization, um, sometimes even against other workers in the papermaking and forest industry. So if we look here at one of the examples of, of uh, strikes um, in, in 1980, uh, you can see that some, some here strikers are, are trying to prevent work, uh, wood from being delivered to the mill. Um, but many of those workers, uh, even the, 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 the uh, pulp drivers, um, are, are also precarious in their kind of um, contributions um, and precarious workers in, in their kind of, you know, detachment from, let's say, the, the kind of corporate um, structure of the mill itself, right? So um, uh, this has been referred to in, in historical and theoretical discourse as uh, a tactic of milita uh, per militant particularism, um, which is a kind of forced insularity that kind of corporate structures impose that starts to pit workers against each other, um, even though they're all kind of fighting for the, the same goal at the end of the day. Um, but it's very difficult to kind of get out of. Um, and, and, and what this does is effectively kind of suppress the development of, 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 of kind of political or class consciousness, these, these things are, these, these kind of theories argue. Um, and so since then, there have been no, no kind of formal strikes um, in, in, uh, at the paper mill or in the River Valley. Um, and this kind of, kind of following this trajectory of labor discourse has been interesting also more broadly in Maine. Um, so in 2011, the uh, Maine uh, governor removed uh, an 11 panel uh, mural that depicts Maine's labor history. Um, by Judy Taylor, who uh, is a main artist, um, and who allowed us to also uh, reprint this uh, this piece in our report, um, which was once on display in Main in the the lobby of Maine's labor department. Um, but it really draws attention to Maine's workers, and it's intended to really celebrate um, the labor uh, history um, and the workers that really uh, construct and, and define Maine. Um, and so the two final panels in the mural represent uh, uh, the strike of 1987 in J um, uh, at the International Paper Company, IP, and uh, the future of Maine's labor, so the left and the right. Um, which depicts a, a kind of worker um, from the past uh, offering a hammer or to, to kind of complex and confused workers of the present in the right. Um, uh, so the, the, younger worker, the younger workers are kind of asking like, what do we do with this, right? Um, but the, the kind of removal of this mural from, from a public space suggests the kind of removal of labor discourse in general, um, the history of labor, la labor organizing, um, and, and removed from the kind of public imagination um, to instead focus on corporate growth and business ownership. Um, but here we are, I think through our report, trying to highlight and, and reinvigorate that labor discourse um, and bring that back into the spotlight, right? Um, so how do you build up labor solidarity across, uh, across uh, kind of global flows and across different platforms, right? And so I started to consider in this report how solidarity uh, and organized bodies work across different movements and geographies and types, um, not just about labor necessarily, but also thinking about environmentalism, thinking about racism, thinking about broader liberatory ethics and efforts. Um, and so one example is in a fight against, let's say, anti-racism, uh, which has a kind of, you know, a, a history that links itself to, to the River Valley. And so the KKK, for example, which represented anti-union politics and, and, and really rep, uh, resented um, anti-French uh, or re resented kind of French, uh, Canadian and Catholic immigrants who, uh, who they claimed were kind of stealing their, their jobs paraded through uh, the community just after the strikes in the 1980s, hoping to kind of recruit members. Um, though, the, though, th though since the town is really comprised of um, 
uh, many immigrant uh, workers, everyone kind of came together and, and pushed them away, right? Um, so some, there are some, since then, there have been some really incredible um, and important anti-racist efforts that are going on in local schools. And maybe we can talk a little bit more about that if, depending on who's, who's here in the, uh, in the chat. Um, but, but the ways in which this is also literally built into the history of the community, right? Another um, example is in the environmental solidarity. So thinking about public spaces that have been also used as a sites of protest against kind of environmental degradation um, and impositions, um, most recently through Nestle, um, through its this subsidiary Poland Springs has begun uh, drilling uh, for water in, in exchange for uh, funding support for the community to help upgrade the town's kind of aging infrastructure. So this kind of, kind of, kind of conundrum of dependence, but also independence. Um, and Carrie was very active in this fight. Um, so I think it's important for us to think about the various spaces. And this is really what we kind of conclude uh, through the, the public space part of this report. Um, to think about the, the various kind of public spaces uh, and the ways in which people come together, um, not just to play sports or to hang out, but also to think about where the communities of workers can band together to remember actually these moments from the past and to help carry these lessons onward in the future, right? And in their work. Um, so that was my bit. I just wanna say one more thing. I, yeah, a couple of things, I, I took a couple notes because sure. I learned something every time we talk about this, but interesting to note that the, the KKK came to Mexico right after that second really nasty strike and fascinating that the previous, the, the fight was between you know town members and suddenly here are, they're pushing back against racism, with, which I think is really incredible. Um, also just the, to, to tie up the Nestle debacle, so that that was happening while I was working on my book. Um, actually, all the everything is in the in my book, but in a way, um, the that that strike I want to say was was a really big pivot point in American manufacturing on the whole. I think and 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 reading Aaron, what Aaron has to say about it is really fascinating. It's some some things I didn't even consider when working on my book. And then the Nestle debacle, you know, um, really hard to. Um, uh, a very small group came together to resist Nestle, but Nestle had muscled in long before the community could even get a foothold. Um, they move fast, these big corporations. You know, they have teams of lawyers. Um, they're, they're attending to their bottom line, not to the community anyway. That, I mean, to, to go so far as they, they established this community liaison office, and I went there numerous times, and there was nobody there <laughs> and nobody, and they say call and I would call and nobody would respond. That's their community liaison. I just thought I would mention that. One more thing too, that you said something interesting, hold on. Oh, about the glossy magazines that was back, back up a little. I just want you to know, Aaron, that I have, I am probably going to be writing something for National Geographic. <laughs> and I brought this up to them about the paper and they were like, I said, maybe we could do a story on that. And they were like, no, that magazines probably won't want to publish that story. <laughs> anyway. So should I talk about this too? Yeah, go for it. Briefly, I, um, you can look at, I'm, I'm just going to repeat mostly what's on my website. And this is called the Cancer Yearbook. Um, it's on my website and it's just very fledgling right now, but I plan to really, um, really fill it out more this summer. What it is, is instead of a regular yearbook, this is a yearbook of people who have had cancer and believe it might be related to environmental causes in, in, from the mill. And the reason I wanted to do this was not to... Um, to let there be another kind of evidence between the scientific besides the scientific reports or besides the mill saying that nothing is going wrong or anything. I just thought people needed to say their stories. And, and it also came about because after my book published or my book published, actually, I think the day this report was due or something, it was really in concert. I, I, I've gotten a lot of emails from people telling me their stories. And I thought there has to be a place for this, you know, um, and to make it like a yearbook to say, here's our community. Um, this was the intent of this. And if anybody in the community is listening, I would love to hear from you. I may expand this to the whole state of Maine since the uh, cancer rates are so high in Maine. Um, but please contact me. My email is on my website. That's what this is. Um, and the last part was a, um, I did a, let's see, how do we say? 
maybe we can get into it in the questioning, but I did an, a, a new sort of environmental, a new mapping of um, memorials and monuments of, um, hold on, I'm just gonna pull up a couple notes. Um, as I was working on the book and this report, monuments and memorials I, I saw, or they're always editorialized no matter where you are. And they're an archive to our past and our past is always subjective depending on who tells the story, right? So everywhere in the River Valley I went, I saw monuments and memorials to resource extraction. So my idea, like we'd see a, a statue of, of Hugh Chisholm or Paul Bunyan, which you just saw. Um, so my idea was to reconsider and reconfigure those monuments. I was a little bit inspired by Edward Bertansky's photography, who he explores the residual landscapes and nature transformed through industry, the wonder and awe of nature. And, and it goes in direct contrast to the wonder and awe of the sublime that you were talking about earlier, um, which I didn't even make that connection until you said it out loud. So, um, so Bertansky writes, and this is from his website, but I want to read it because I feel like it's so similar. And you can just look at, this is an interactive PDF that's on the website. So I'm not going to go into detail about it, but I have some pretty crazy ideas, but I actually think I would like to see some of them come to fruition, like dressing up Paul Bunyan, like Ed Muskie, um, who penned the Clean Air and the Clean Water Act. And he was also from our community. So anyway, here's what Bertansky writes. His images are meant as metaphors to the dilemma of our modern existence. They search for a dialogue between attraction and repulsion, seduction and fear. We are drawn by desire, a chance at good living, yet we are consciously or unconsciously aware that the world is suffering for our success. Our dependence on nature to provide the materials for our consumption and our concern for the health of the planet sets us into an uneasy contradiction. For me, these images function as reflecting pools of our times. Um, there, well, that's all I'll say about that for now. So Nick, are we, we're ready to move into the discussion section. Okay, um, I'm gonna put, I'm Rosalie Ginevra and I'm gonna, um, launch the first question, which is a big question. And it's one that um, actually um, is relevant to many of the reports in this series. You paint um, all of you, all of the contributors together, a very compelling, powerful picture of how, of both the, um, the very strong identity of this place, um, and the very powerful presence of its history and what that history has meant for the health um, as, and the livelihood of people over time. What, what do you see, and there, I, there, since there are many people from the community here, I'm, I think it'd be interesting to hear from multiple people. What do you see as a plausible and viable both economically and environmentally and desirable future for Rumford and Mexico going forward. Because they, um, the paper mill is operating um, still now. It seems, I, I don't know if this is accurate, but it seems that its, it's future is not 100% guaranteed and certainly you know, global um, demand for different kinds of paper and um, where paper is produced is, is changed a lot over time. But what is the future that you want for Rumford given, given what exists in Mexico, given what exists there in terms of the, both the natural and now the built environment of the place? Aaron, Aaron can, I, can I start? I just, I wanna say something that, um, I feel like really the question is, it, part of this question is how, and I was listening to Rob McFarlane, who's a, an author and he teaches at Cambridge. He was in a talk at Duke yesterday and it really made me think about this. He said, how can we be good ancestors? And what he means by this is like, how can we look at the future with retrospect? So cast your mind forward to look back. You know, um, he asks, he, he said he asked the students to do this. And I ask everybody here to do this. Like, imagine you're sitting here now looking back on this moment, like you're in the future looking back. What would you see and how would you judge what you see? And so he said this exercise allows us to be more empathetic to our future. 
and our past. Like, so he, he, if he asked me this question, I would say, don't engage with colonial capitalist efforts. Keep things smaller, more equitable. I mean, idealistically, we need we need deep systemic change, especially you know in the way we engage with land. For instance, I lived in Sweden for two years, and uh, land use rights in Sweden is an example of how common access slash common rights, which is also something Rob talked about yesterday, bring common responsibility. So in Sweden, you can basically go, you have a right to land use as long as you respect the land. And everybody has that sort of agreement to do that. And so that that common access goes along with common responsibility. And that's something we could really use here in this town or in America. Um, and part of my idea behind that environmental map that I was just talking about too, is to make people confront and make visible the problems that have arisen because of our historical engagement with the land. Because if you confront something every day, it becomes hard to ignore, especially if it's as big as Paul Bunyan. Um, so that's, 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 I have a lot more to say, but I just, you know, that's a start. I, I think that's how I'm looking at it. You know, I mean, on a, on a more specific note, can the industrial use of the buildings be kept? Can it employ people in more sustainable, environmentally friendly industries? Probably, even though there's a super fun site lurking under the mill. But, you know, I think before we even consider the land, which I just mentioned, we have to consider the displaced worker first. Service jobs, tourism are low paying, they're part time, they offer no benefits. Short term games are unhelpful, we all know. Um, also, Maine is really isolated, more so than like urban centers where mills have sort of redeveloped themselves. They've turned into housing or business. You know, Rumford doesn't need housing or business, they need jobs. So, um, you know, I don't know, Aaron, what do you think? Or, and then I'd like to ask people in the community what they think too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's fascinating, a fascinating question and one that's very difficult, I think, for, for us to answer with kind of prescriptive detail. Because um, I think it's, it's as, as Carrie mentioned, really up for, uh, up to the community really to think through like the, that, that next step and what that future might look like. Um, but I think what this history points out at some level is, um, is this kind of shift that's that's taken place? You know, not only a kind of global shift, but also one from industrial to post-industrialism um, that has not been fully kind of considered within the community, right? So there's still kind of industrial work that's taking place, um, but but not yet a kind of uh, way in which that that workers are kind of engaging in a post-industrial kind of global economy, right? So so perhaps three kind of meta things about how the community competes in kind of global and post-industrial economies is really a big question, I think, to consider. Um, so how do workers, for example, like regain a sense of connection to what they make, right? Um, and then figure out how to communicate that uh, uh, to the world. Um, and so there seems to be a kind of resurgence, I think, at the particular at this per particular moment, in uh, understandings of an, an appreciation of craft and of making um, mm -hmm. uh, circulated by online platforms. Uh, you know, we think of like Etsy, for example, right? Um, that allow for for artists to to really participate in these global flows. Um, so so how might this kind of imply a kind of shift in in, in a kind of regaining of of control over over the making? Secondly, I think perhaps understanding what exactly can be celebrated in the future, right? Like what exactly is worthy of celebration um, in terms of like what workers do or what the community does or, or who the community is, right? So thinking about the incredible craft, thinking about the quality of work, um, the local knowledge, right? Um, and, and then figuring out ways to kind of amplify that. Um, in the global uh, corporate reports by by Nine Dragons at the moment, in the kind of Chinese-based um, uh, annual annual company reports, I have found super fascinating the ways that the mill, the Rumford Mill in particular, was cited and described to shareholders of the of the global company as known for its quality of workers, known for its customer service, known for the kind of specialty and the the kind of quality of the paper that's produced. So I think at some level, the question is like, how do you then as workers and as a community regain that kind of ownership, right? Uh, of, of that labor and of that the product uh, that one produces. Um, and if we take a company like Apple, for example, right? Um, 
uh, rather than invest in investing in industrial factories here in the United States, there, you know, these are being constructed and produced in, in China, right? But the Apple offices here in the United States are thinking more about researching trends and, and markets and consumers, a kind of post-industrial kind of labor. Um, so rather than kind of investing in this or reinvesting in extending these kind of legacies of industrial production, like how do you then teach or share or build upon the knowledge um, that, that the community already holds. Um, and regardless, I think it's just important to consider that kind of global connection, right? The global, the ways in which we have to confront the kind of global uh, flows and, and networks that, that exist, um, how they work and what that might mean for, for I think the River Valley is our, our kind of crucial questions, I think, to consider. Yeah, that's great. Great points. I mean, you know, extracting, maybe we can extract labor <laughs> in a good way, like sustainable labor, you know, maybe they can make something that actually is sustainable itself, like solar panels or something that's more sustainable than what they're making, you know, something like that. Um, um, somebody just pointed out in the chat, and I do want to make sure that people know that, that they stopped making the white, nasty paper the polluting paper just recently and switched to craft paper, which I find pretty exciting. Um, you know, there are other ways to bleach paper that's safer, but they didn't, they didn't go that route. They're making a different kind of paper now. So I haven't been following. Um, so th there's a, a lot to unpack in your two responses, but <laughs> one thing I just sort of start on that um, has been really a through line across many of the reports has been the, the sort of question of um, control over land and, and resources. And that we see in, in so many of these communities, um, outside entities, um, people who have the capital not being local. And you mentioned, um, I mean, obviously there's the, a, you know, centuries long history of, of the lumber and, and paper interests in Maine. And then um, Carrie, you were talking about the sort of Nestle recently. So you mentioned the, the Swedish model, um, but I may be curious to hear more your thoughts on how a community might um, gain kind of greater agency if they don't right now have that ownership or, yeah. um, or capital. And what are the, what um, potential um, ways uh, might a community gains more of that control um, absent a completely rethinking, you know, <laughs> of, of our economic models? Right. Yeah. Um, the economics of the United States. No, um, I think very simple things, actually. Um, this, I mean, what you're asking is at the heart of some of the problems, not just in our town, but in so many towns like it. I mean, yes, the, the collective common access comes calmer responsibility. But to have more ownership, I think residents of any police need to express that ownership, whether it is through resistance, like we discussed, change, involvement, or even love. Like, for example, the, the water district holds their meetings at 3 p.m., which is this shift change at the mill. It was so frustrating to try to go to water district meetings that um, that that were start that started at 3 p.m. for a lot of people in the community. So like if everybody could get together and change that, or if people just started going to the the the, the meetings at the beginning to be that involved is a is a kind of ownership. You see what I mean? So that is one way. Um, you know. Another way is just small actions. You start, you start small. You start at the school. I know the principal, school, high school principal is on this call and maybe some teachers, but like stop using bottled water at the school. And then maybe the maybe it will extend to like other public spaces. And then maybe it will extend to the town. And then maybe it would extend through the state. So like really small actions and really small movements. You don't have to be an activist to take ownership. You don't have to be marching or, or publishing. You could just go to meetings so you know, so you're informed. Or you can, you know, if you really want to be, you know, run for town office. You know, those are the really simple ways that people, I think, can take ownership. Does that, does that help ans start answering the question? <laughs> I think it's as simple as that, really. And I, I say this all the time in talks in my book. I'm like, and vote. Like, vote for people who will choose your life over your death, like really simple. That care about you, not just the bottom line. And the environment. Yes, in that we are part of the environment. I see it as all. There's a comment in the chat, um, maybe to that point, that in the last decade, the, over, the overwhelming smell of the operating plants diminished 
And is that an outcome of more stringent environmental regulations or it's something else going on? I mean, you smell is a really good indicator of toxics in the environment, but I wouldn't say it's the only indicator. I mean, there are, there are things that are um, happening now. There, there are certain, um, for instance, and this is all legitimate, and all legal and all under the regulations, but they the mill does burn um, used tires for fuel to generate fuel. But um, a lot of the reporting I've read, and I have to dig into it more, that um, because of the way tires are defined as a special fuel, they kind of subvert a lot of the Clean Air and Clean Water Act's um, um, regulations. So they're, they're, they're different. They're not considered a waste. And there's just a lot in the definitions. I mean, going back to, you know, John Freeman's book, the definitions of things um, matter. So it was something I started to research and got really uh, down a rabbit hole because it was hard to find, to, to actually track the wording of what that means. So I wouldn't say that, I would say that a lot of things, the surface has been cleaned up, but you know, if you went like this in the river, the, the, the chemicals and the, and the toxics are all still there, you know, um, you still can't eat the fish really. You shouldn't eat the fish and all that stuff goes into the Atlantic ocean. So I don't think it's gone by any means. I think it's just lurking there. <laughs> um, and it's in our DNA. Every single one of us on this phone call has, um, you know, what I found in my book is that uh, there's enough carcinogen in the food supply, which is um, a lot of the stuff that's created as a uh, byproduct of paper making is in our DNA. And there's enough carcinogens in one hamburger to make us all sick. So it's not in the past, it's in our bodies. <laughs> that mix, I'm, that actually leads to another um, question that you've both been talking about during the discussion and, and maybe is most evident in um, Carrie, your piece on monuments and memorials, but how do we balance that reckoning with the past and confronting and making visible, but also an optimistic future and um, a sense that there is um, almost a sort of boosterish, you know, sense of what the town could be. I mean, that's it, it, it obviously both need to happen, um, but how do you, how might you strike that balance between the two in a place like the River Valley or anywhere else? Um, first, I just want to recognize that a couple of people in the chat, um, Greg Buccina says the re river has, I just want to recognize they're saying stuff. And <laughs> the river has recently been upgraded, which is good. It's mostly been an industrial river. Um, 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 I just wanted to say that. Um, I don't know. I don't, I'm not sure I understand the question beyond, let's see. Um, well, I think, you like, know, go ahead. Maybe speaking to the question of like representing history in the future. Um, and, and one of the lessons that comes out of the strikes is that, um, you know, that with each strike, there was kind of a loss of what happened in the last, last strike. Um, mm -hmm. And so a number of scholars have, have written about, especially in Jay, um, how, you know, the kind of the critiques to the strike were, were the kind of insularities, right? Like that, that if, if they would have, you know, perhaps engaged with other kind of networks of, of, of solidarity groups beyond just the kind of immediate site, you know, regionally um, or a, across industry lines, that there would have been a kind of greater strength uh, in solidarity. And so the lesson there is that the kind of history was lost and then kind of, you know, reproduces itself over and over again. Um, so then how, I guess the question is like, how do you maintain these legacies and these histories and all of these lessons that have been learned and, recon and constructed um, and carry that onward, you know? So I think part of the, this report was doing, trying to do some of that, like bring, you know, I grew up in, in the River Valley, but I had no clue about a lot of this history, right? Um, and, and, you know, when I went to the uh, historical society for, for some of this research, there was really no um, history on the, the mill uh, in, in terms of the architecture, how it was designed, where it came from, who designed it, um, which I found to be really interesting, um, especially since it's tied to this, you know, global project. So how can we then think about like the ways in which this community like is a microcosm for other working class communities, but also fundamentally connected to other communities, um, you know, uh, in, in these kind of common core uh, struggles. So I think 
Um, I think you said something really interesting right there, common core. I mean, you know, it, neither Aaron and I knew about any of this until I'm, you know, I'm 53 years old and I'm just learning, you know, I just in the past 10 years have learned about this history. So maybe that's what needs to, you know, ed, not just education, but just like knowledge, like historical knowledge that is, that is more expansive, you know, like even, even if you just take, so in the schools, you know, we used to have to do this Maine notebook. I don't know if you had to do that. We had to like do this big report in junior high about Maine. Never did we talk about environmental. Never we talk about paper mills. We didn't talk about Acadians, which half our town or more than half our town was composed of, you know, all kinds of uh, legacies and, and, and things we didn't know anything about. Um, I think some of that should be incorporated and talked about. And once it's talked about, which is my point about the map, if it's talked about, you can't ignore it. And therefore you have to confront it and you have to deal with it. You know, like one of my ideas is to put up a big, one of those big flashing road signs they put up when there's a big blizzard and just say like landfill here, landfill here, just like flashing. Right. Because if you drive by that every day, you're going to be like, let's, get that landfill out of there or whatever. I don't know. I don't know what the result is, but the reminder is there. Um, I also, I don't know. Yeah, that's what I think. Um. <laughs> I wonder if um, there's there's some really interesting comments in the chat. Um, I think we purposely made this session um, one in which people could talk. Am I right, Nick? They, um, so, um, Matthew Gilbert, um, how do we get kids to see the variety of opportunities for making a good living that aren't dependent on the mill? If, if you're willing, do you want to say something to expand on that a little bit? Because I think that's that's a really essential point. How how do people in the community take control and? Um, imagine alternative futures that are not dependent on the one, um, the industry that's been so dominant up to now. Matt, I would love if you spoke. Matt is the principal at the high school. Thanks. Thanks. I was looking for an opportunity to see you. <laughs> Aaron, it's, uh, uh, Gary, it's nice to see you. I see you in the building a lot. Um, I, it's been great to see you over the last 10 years working on that. And Aaron, uh, I can't believe, uh, proud of that you're a graduate of Mountain Valley High School. So <laughs> great, to, great to see. And, and here's our challenge. And this is why I'm talking, that's why I'm, my comment is about, um, we have a lot of really bright young people here in this school, um, but we have a difficult time seeing what's available in this community for opportunity outside of what's available connected to the mill. And we have some of our sharpest minds will go off to become engineers. And that's great. But not every engineer needs to work in the mill and then or go and become a machinist. And that's fantastic or electrician. And, and instead of having an entrepreneurial spirit of trying to do something new, the idea is I'll get it and then I'll come back to what I know is will, has been there for generations and I'm hoping will be there for generations. And so we have this big magnet that brings everybody that the kids that, that want to come back, it brings them back to that location and not creating our next, our next evolution of whatever Rumford is. And I, I say that I've, I've been working here for 20 years and I grew up in Jay. So I, I feel like I, I'm a Milltown, there's, there's a lot of DNA, Milltown DNA in me. Um, and I think that when you have that big anchor employer, there might not be, you know, the there might not be the the company store anymore, but boy, it feels like there is sometimes, and everything is connected to that. So, and then the other thing that's always amazed me about Rumford, Maine, is this is a great community with all kinds of resources for the people in it, but the people that live in it don't value it. And whether it's a world class skiing facility that we have. Uh, the the um, Hosmer Field Complex. We have two beautiful rivers, an incredible amount of mountains and streams. It's it's a picturesque area that that you know that it just isn't valued the same way that it would be if it was 30 minutes south of here. And it's really interesting. Of course, we're also a bit of a geographical island without having too much water around us because if you're from Rumford and you live in Rumford and you work in Rumford, you have to be in Rumford. You aren't close enough to any other population centers to really make it a commutable distance to anything. So I do get that we're isolated, 
Um, I, I just wish, you know, why, why doesn't someone look at some of those old buildings at the mill mm -hmm. and say, this is a great place for elderly housing or the brick park, which is gorgeous. The brick I know. Park, say, boy, this would be a fantastic set of condos or, you know, there's just, why don't we have some, somebody and what do we need to do? And I'm rambling. I know. No, I have an idea. You need the good PR and marketing person, first of all. I mean, honestly, because I've had some tourism, tourism ex professionals that work in Maine talk to me at, at some of my book events, and they're like, "How can we? How can we help?" Really interesting. And you say, and I'm glad you brought this up because it is. If you just kind of push them, just do this with the mill, but it's beautiful there. No, it is. I mean, you've got everything. You've been hiking, hunting. We talk about this in the report. Um, skiing. I mean, I learned to ski there. Everything. It's really incredible um, area. So the natural beauty and the, the ways in which that could be, that's a good exploitation, right? Like get people there. And like maybe some of these, maybe we should hook up some of these tourist professionals because they've been so busy, like marketing the coast. And I think that's part of the problem. You know, advertisements have been one dimensional in Maine, presenting a Maine that is idealized on the coast. And if they do that, then they put places like, like Rumford, who are just already isolated. They put you out of sight and out of mind. It's like how they, it's like how garbage is treated out of sight, out of mind. Right. Um, and, and if, it, and if it's out of sight, it becomes invisible and invisibility is the biggest problem that Rumford has. And so, Part of this report and part of my book is to say, this is not, it's not invisible, you know, and it's not to say, you know, some people have said, oh, it's critical. It's not, it's to say, these people are not invisible. This town is not invisible. They are beautiful, wonderful people living here in this beautiful place. Like, let's pay attention. So I think attention is half the problem. And then real world, you know, solutions, obviously too. I mean, the only, yeah, there has to be, like Aaron and I were talking about, there has to be some kind of reimagining of the industry there, which I think could be fantastic because you already have like really hard workers, loyal workforce, really good people, sense of community, sense of family. You have it all. Just to have uh, like attract an industry that's not extracting like Nestle or not, you know, or like the, you know, something that's giving something. And that, that's where you need to like apply your economic resource direct uh, development director or somebody like that, or maybe work in concert with bigger organizations in the state or even federal programs. I think it could be really amazing. I mean, and as for kids, just in general, I can say the, the reason, the only reason I ever left Maine was because I went on a trip to New York city and I thought I saw something else. Like, I think, not, I'm not saying you want people to leave. You want them to leave and come back and bring, you know, you don't want the brain drain, but like I saw something else and that something else wasn't available in Rumford. If you could, you know, work with, I think, bigger organizations to, to help reimagine it. I think it's the word imagination, which goes along with the advertisement in a way. What do you think, Aaron? Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think that that sense of beauty comes with being removed at some level, right? So now when, when we return, you know, I, I see the, the community through a different set of lenses um, and, and really start to appreciate, you know, I think I've hiked more since I have left the community than, than I did growing up there, you know, or like really done a lot of kind of appreciative kind of acts in, in, in nature. Um, but I think to your question about, um, you know, encouraging students, for example, is, is an interesting one, I think, that I struggle with also as a, as a teacher in New Mexico. Um, and, and I think it's interesting to think perhaps about the ways in which the mill isn't just a place to work, but also represents a number of kind of histories and lessons about the world, right? That can perhaps be embedded in courses, right? And so when you look at the mill, you see, okay, there's an engineering uh, 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 kind of aspect, right? There's a kind of a uh, whole history of capitalism in the 20th century. There's a whole history of labor politics. There's, so, I mean, when we think about like US history, teaching US history at the high school level, like how can we perhaps, you know, use the, the, the kind of the back door really um, as part of uh, uh, encouraging or exciting these, these different channels and opportunities for students to, to get into, right? Um, because I think there's just so much that that's embedded in the mill um, and the community um, that, that offers lessons for students and that might be you know, exciting or encouraging. Um, so in, in New Mexico, I often find, you know, when I present these kind of big picture histories of, of world architecture, 
you know, many of my students grew up on Native American reservations um, and they, they kind of come to class and say, well, who cares about what was going on in Europe? Like this doesn't relate at all to my life, you know? So I had to figure out ways to, to kind of pull in immediate context that, you know, the New Mexican landscape, the New Mexican architecture into the classes as a way to connect with them. Um, and it really just to kind of inspire them to think about these connections through their, their kind of um, lens and through their, their kind of familiar objects and history. So, um, in yeah. other words, teach our report, Matt. <laughs> you need to teach my book and the report. No, but in a way, because it gets people to just think very broadly about what a you know, we're imagining it and, and or, or teaching them about Acadian history. Like, is that a class? I don't know. It should be. The Acadian population was instrumental in the whole industrial um, revolution in the United States. They really were. That's another whole issue, but... Um, so um, I have um, someone, uh, Beverly Susie has um, raised her hand. I know we wanted to get to her. Yeah, um, I think you should be able to speak now if you'd like. <laughs> Hi, I'm not sure you're all going to want me to speak because I have a lot to say. Um, <laughs> Hi, Carrie. Good to see you. Aaron Kerr, um, is it your family that lives up on Linnell Street? Uh, my grandmother. Um, she lives down the street from me, and I know your whole darn family. So oh. with, that being, with that being said, I love your family. Carrie, good to see you. Nice to meet and see everyone here. Um, a couple people know me. So I'm an online writer for um, a, a publication that has a little over 2,100 people in the 10 towns of the River Valley called River Valley Voice. And there's so much about this discussion. I'm glad that we were all on mute because I was over here screaming at you. Oh. Um, there's so much about this that really, that I disagree with and that really speaks to me. And I've made a whole page of notes and- um, Email me, no. I, I will, I will, but I try to start <laughs> off with Rosalie's question about things that we can change. And, and one of my constants is every single day, I write about only seeing the positive. Now, I left two days after high school in 1980 and I never looked back and then found myself back in the place that I started about five and a half years ago. So with that, I only ended up in Southern Maine, but again, another mill town um, that has transformed itself after a very long stagnant period into one of the fastest and upcoming um, cities in Southern Maine, the Biddeford Saco area. So yeah. when Carlo was our town manager, Carlo Puya, I used to um, invite him down and send him information all the time because for me, I saw what was happening there. Um, I worked on Main Street America. I was witness to big corporations like Nike and West Point Pepperell leaving the area. Um, and so I watched everything kind of shut down and then get reborn. I see that happening in the River Valley and a couple of things that I'm taking personally today are the stigma that comes with the past. Um, right out of the gate, Cancer Valley, you know what? That is so far back there that I don't want it to hold a place here anymore. And while we need to recognize history, I think that that stigma, along with Aaron Kerr, I screamed at you too, um, about the, the strike. I think that we have to stop talking about those things. Do we need to recognize them in order to move forward? Yes. Do we need to know about those um, for, for sickness and cancer? I'm a cancer survivor. I can't rule out that that didn't happen in my childhood because I too have the DNA, um, but we need to kind of put those subjects on the shelf. Um, as for the water study, Carrie, that we need more recent information. Everything is so outdated. I swam in that river. I, I swam there every single day in the summer for the last five and a half years and I was blown away. Would I eat the fish out of there? Well, I wouldn't because I wouldn't catch one. <laughs> That's my only reason. So um, there's, there's so many things. Okay, so to touch on a couple of other things, the mill really isn't the focus anymore. We have a town of 
um, roughly 6,000 people with maybe 800 of them in the mill. And that just kind of brings that, that scope of where our focus is, is just a little bit broader. And to speak to the economic developer's credit, we do have a PR person and we do have all of the buildings downtown have been sold, they're being gutted, they're being remodeled. We have money um, available from the community to help make that happen. The tech building, which was part of the, correct me if I'm wrong, the number 10 paper machine, that's been sold to a private entity and it's getting developed. Um, and, and I see a lot of quintessential small businesses coming here. And what it reminds me of is how Eastport has transformed itself. Eastport is up in Eastport. It's, it's one of my favorite places, but it's a little small town where there really is no place to go for a job. So when you have that, how do you keep your kids here? Matt, I'll tell you how. You teach them about finding their passion. You teach them about loving the simplicity of a good quality of life. And you prepare them by way of trade school, which Region 9, love that place. That's a whole other discussion. You, you send them over there and you give them a trade and then you teach them how to start a small business. That is how you keep this town moving forward um, in a really healthy in a really healthy way. So um, I would say that what I observe right now is that more people are getting excited about what they're gifted with and they're opening stores that are, they're not specifically co-ops, but they're working with each other to share each other's goods. And it's everywhere. It's not just the bakery who's sharing um, her cake with the restaurant and the restaurant advertising the cake. It's the artists at the tattoo shop sharing their um, advertisement at our fair. So there's lots of little, um, I don't know what you say, pockets of people that are really making a difference on the down low. And right now, because our economic developer, and I have some personal issues with things that go on, I always will, but to his credit, he has filled every single business on the island with things that are about to happen and then add the new hotel. Oh my God. So the passion that you hear in my voice is you all are crazy for thinking that we are, you know, overlooked and understated because there is. Okay. So okay I'm going to say something now. I'm going to say something now. <laughs> If it's, I love everything you said, Beverly, Sorry. thank you so much. And I think a huge point, one huge point that you made that I didn't talk about, which is so important is that our nation has been so set on like, if you don't get a higher education, you're not going to be successful. And I think you're right. People need to look at trades. Like if I could go back to school, I'd be like something else because being a writer is not lucrative. Trust me. I would like <laughs> learn how to fix pipes. Like my father did. I'd have, a, I'd be like a, you know, a plumber. Anyway, I think that's really important. You can be successful if we change that definition of success to say you, you don't have to get, you know, a college degree to be successful. It's a huge uh, thing, but I wouldn't say that I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to agree with you that, that the, the, um, the um, poisons and the toxics in the river and in the atmosphere, it's not history. Um, all the studies I've done are current up until a few years ago. And then the biggest study that has been shelved is at the EPA, um, is on the EPA bookshelf. And, and I was told by a man who studied this for his entire lifetime that if if the EPA published that study on dioxins that come from paper making, that it would disrupt the entire um, US economy. So they're never gonna publish that paper. So. I wouldn't say that anything is in the past. And I, I, do, I do agree there's a point where you start, stop talking about it, but I don't think this conversation has yet been had in this community. And I do agree, we talk about it, we look at it, like we're having this conversation right now. I think it's wonderful that you're here and so many people, but it hasn't been talked about. This is like really the first time. I mean, it's been talked about in the wider public arena. So, so I, will start ta I will stop talking about it as soon as we have these kind of good conversations. I, I just wanna quickly add that I, I, I also sympathize and, and I, I really appreciate your, your thoughts um, and comments. And, and just to the, the kind of point of the negative past, right? I think perhaps that, that the way that it was presented or you know, the discussion that we've been having suggests a kind of negative view of the past, but I think 
you know, what we've tried to do is really highlight the positives, right? Like the lessons that we learn from these strikes. And, and so as you're talking about these moments of Baker, you know, the Baker coordinating with the, the tattoo parlor or whatever it might be, right? Those are also moments of collective kind of coming together in solidarity. Um, and so I think there, there are these important lessons from the past that are actually positive, right? And then help us think about the future in really interesting ways and to be proud of, you know, how the work, how the community has banded together in the past, right? I think those are all important important lessons to, to bring forward, but, but in my view, those are inspiring to me, right? Like I'm proud, more proud to be from this community when I learn more about it, right? And its history and, and, and all that it represents. So I think that that past is actually one of the, the kind of key features of, of a kind of lively and empowering future, right? And like owning that past um, and thinking about even what the architecture suggests, right? As you're talking about the island, you know, that's an incredible past um, that, that is also, you know, an opportunity for thinking about um, embellishing in the future. So um, I, don't, I don't totally see that all of the past bits as, as negative, though I think it's very easy to think of that in that way, right? Um, so, so how do we then pull out those, those kind of positive dimensions or the kind of positive lessons that we can continue to inform the future? Mm -hmm. I think that's actually a really wonderful way to, um, in some way, to describe the American Roundtable project. And that you know, it both our our goal through all of this is both to um, reckon with the past and to learn from it and to confront it, um, but at the same time to look forward and to do so with optimism. And I don't the the, the point of this entire project is to um, listen and to learn from communities. Um, to think about how we can improve futures and um, to already harness all the amazing work and energy that is happening. And that is um, what sort of the original premise that is often um, overlooked. So this and that inherent tension, I think between the two is actually very much um, baked into <laughs> this and um, something that we are um, hoping to explore and celebra celebrate. So we are um, kind of reaching the end. Um, obviously we could go on for hours and there, I know there are so many um, really fascinating questions in the um, chat still, which we will be sure to share um, with Aaron and, and Carrie um, and folks. Um, just to, before we um, leave, I just wanted to see if um, Tom, Steve, or NB had any um, thoughts that they wanted to add. Um, I think one thing that's been really interesting is um, the view that artists um, bring to understanding a place. And I think through your work, um, you all made us think and listen to um, the River Valley in, in fresh ways. Um, so I just wanted to make sure you had a chance to say something if, if you would like to. Well, I, I guess I could start. Um, uh, it, it's been interesting to, to look at, at the remains of, of the industrial, our industrial past, and to see how they're all hiding in plain sight. There's some really beautiful things out there that we just never see. We walk by them every day and, and they're there. Um, it, I, you know, I'm encouraged that, okay, there's been this incredible rape of the land, but the trees come back, <laughs> they grow. <laughs> And and you know um, uh, and and they do uh, clean the air. They clean you know they clean the water. Uh, and uh, I, I think that we you know that we have to look at at at, at all of this this stuff. The uh, um, that's what your art does. It looks at things like very carefully, which is what's wonderful about it. You yeah, know, well, you're I, looking at it literally. <laughs> I, I, I love Yogi Berra said that you can see a lot just by watching. That's why we need art right there. And listening, perhaps, right, Steve? <laughs> <laughs> listening helps too. <clears throat> we, um, uh, we made that piece uh, last summer, um, and if you recall, last summer was uh, a little bit of a dark time. Um, and so, uh, if you if you listen to the piece, you find that it goes in um, perhaps what Beverly might uh, describe as a pessimistic uh, direction, um, where uh, the you know the idea to contrast. Um, a, a relatively unspoiled uh, sonic environment with um, <clears throat> with the the downtown traffic in the mill 
um, uh, we we chose to 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 make it go in that direction, but um, but you could easily imagine listening to it and then sort of flipping it around in your head uh, and going the other way, and that's certainly um, uh, what is uh, uh, plausibly more hopeful right now. Um, uh, when you think just, you know, perhaps we're on the <clears throat> backside of the, uh, the pandemic, perhaps um, we'll start to see some, some uh, good uh, environmental action um, taking place uh, <clears throat> from a regulatory perspective, which was uh, positively not the, the case last summer. Um, but those sorts of... <clears throat> Those sorts of the, the directionality of the uh, of, of the you know sort of the, the uh, sorry the the optimism pessimism um, uh, thing is in a, in a lot of ways it's it's uh, it's inherent in in us and what we you know all of us and what we try to um, put forth. Thank you. Um, Karen, Aaron, do you have any final words? That you'll One more final word and I'll, be, I'll shut up. But I think that I agree with Beverly that there's a lot to talk about that's positive. And we do in this report and I do in my book. But I also think, but not talking about the problems that it creates the illusion that everything is okay and everything is not okay. Um, so we need to take both of those things into consideration. And I think that's a perfect close. <laughs> I won't add uh, <laughs> anything further. Wonderful. Um, well, thank you all. And thank you for everyone for um, a really uh, invigorating conversation. And obviously um, this is only the start. There is much, much more um, to come. Um, and we hope to continue discussion um, both about the River Valley, but also all of um, American communities across um, across the US. Um, please um, visit archley.org to um, see the full schedule of upcoming programs and to read all the reports. And we very much um, hope to see you all again soon. Thank you all for um, joining us today. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Thanks, Rosalie. Thanks, Thank everyone. Take care. Thank you.